Father, thank you. Uh, it is a happy day because in your presence we are free. In your presence, God, we are your children who are loved by you. I, I know we're in, you enjoy us. And God, you have made us in your image. And I pray that, Father, we would recognize what a wonderful God you are. I pray today that you just give me um, your insight and your ability to tell the truth. And I pray that people will be excited about what it means to be um, a person who can live in your peace, have your rest. We love you, Father. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, you got to hang in there. We are two more days, and we'll be done with all of this presidential craziness. That means we are done. We are done. We're going to be done with hearing the late. Well, I'm not positive, but all the latest results from the latest polls. If the sky is blue on Tuesday, who will win, President Obama or Governor Mitt Romney? If it's rainy, President Mitt Romney has a better chance, according to these latest polls. Or if the aliens come down on Tuesday, who will they vote for, President Obama or Governor Mitt Romney? It depends on what kind of car they're driving. Is it domestic or foreign? All the, I'm sick of these polls. It's crazy. But if we were to take one poll, if we were to take either a Zogby poll or ABC poll or a Fox News poll, and we polled people on what is the most popular beatitude in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, I guarantee you, every time, the one we're going to study today would be picked. If you could open up to Matthew chapter 5, we're going to look at verse 9, because this is what everybody wants. It's what we want out of our faith. It's what we want out of our government. It's what we want in the world. Matthew 5, 9 says this, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are the peacemakers. Peace is what we all want. The world needs peace. Rodney King once asked, why can't we all just get along? Why can't President Obama and Mitt Romney get along? Why can't the Muslims and the Jews just get along? Why can't Buckeyes and Wolverines just get along? Man. Uh, we have so many problems. Why can't we just live and let live? Every good and decent person really wants peace. This coming year, January 1st, 2013, for the Roman Catholic Church, they are announcing it World Peace Day. Actually, that's going to be the theme of their next year. Pope Benedict claims, Blessed are the peacemakers, he says. My message this year will embrace human dignity and its freedom. For the building of an earthly city to the service of every person, without any discrimination, and directed to the common good which is based on justice and true peace. In support of this sentiment, one pastor writes, too often, we study other religions simply to pick apart their theological truth claims and establish a basis for our own. We can break this cycle. We can embrace a theology that says human beings are not inherently violent. We can do the important work of being self-aware. To bring peace, we need to engage the mystery of life with commitment and new possibilities. It isn't about believing dogmatic theologies that just want to control, punish, and reward. There's nothing you have to believe. There's no orthodoxy. All we need is an acknowledgement that religion's just a human product. The challenge of our time is to place our creativity in service to humanity and to all earthlings and to earth for present generations and thousands of generations to come. And he ends by saying, this is no small order, but it is our task. Well, that's a noble challenge, honestly. I, through reason and human effort, trying to bring harmony to a chaotic world is praiseworthy. It really is. I want peace too. 
Shouldn't we all give peace a chance? Well, you know, this challenge has been tried before, over and 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 over again. Peace has been tried. There have been countless people who have tried to bring peace to earth through reason and human effort and cooperation. I want to just show you some of the more well-known cases in our last, our last hundred years. Here, I'll show you the rainbow of peace that's been tried. Go ahead and hit it. This is the many faces of peace. On there I have Gandhi, a man who initiated and organized nonviolent demonstrations. He based them on love. He was able to topple the British government without violence, without force. On this is uh, Neville Chamberlain. Neville Chamberlain is in the bottom right. He was the British Prime Minister in the late 1930s. He was tired of European war, so in genuine goodness of heart, he negotiated with Germany's new charismatic leader, Adolf Hitler, to sign a peace treaty between the two countries, which caused him to come back to his country and proclaim, there is peace in our time. Up there you have John Lennon and Yoko Ono. They strongly believe that to establish peace, all you had to do is advertise it. All we need is love. You know, that's John and Yoko. He said, the future of the world is established in the mind. So he wrote the song, Imagine. Imagine all the people. A brotherhood of man. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will be one. You have up there the hippie movement, where at its height, the Woodstock Festival celebrated peace and love for three days in August of 1969. 400,000 love seekers enjoyed music and mud while they listened to Jimi Hendrix play the Star Spangled Banner on his electric guitar. More recently, you have the Occupy Wall Street movement all around our country, where the 99 percenters were spreading peace by encouraging capitalists and bankers to spread their wealth. And then every year, we can always count on the popular Miss America pageant with their 50 beautiful ambassadors to lead the charge for world peace. <laughs> All of these movements are very sincere. The question is, how good have they been? Have they achieved their goal? Have they? Well, sadly, as is the cause with every human endeavor, there's always a dark side to good intentions. Chamberlain didn't just sign a peace treaty. He turned a blind eye to the movements of a Nazi warlord that plunged the whole world into chaos called World War II. Gandhi was asked at that time how, uh, how nonviolent sit-ins could help the Jews from being slaughtered. And here's what he said. The Jews should willingly submit to the Nazi oppression. You know what they should do if they really want the world to notice? Is start jumping off the cliff. He said that. John Lennon's song Imagine didn't work too well when on a cold night in December 1980 he was shot by a man who said he was infuriated by Lennon's hypocrisy because he used to sing about how we all need to share while he actually was a millionaire that lived in countless luxury. But I want to show you a couple pictures to show you how dark peace can get through human effort. The first picture is called the Altamont Music Festival. This happened four months after the Woodstock Festival. Woodstock was in New York on the East Coast. Altamont wanted to be the West Coast Woodstock. They organized a lar large concert, but instead of three days of peace, you had three days of extreme violence and murder. This is a picture that shows the Hells Angels who were supposed to be the bodyguards for all of the music groups like the Rolling Stones. But if anybody got close to the stage, the Hells Angels would take sawed off pool sticks to beat concert goers into submission. Later that night when really things got low, one concert goer pulled out a gun and instantly was attacked and stabbed by one of the Hells Angels. The hippie movement itself found that underneath their tie-dyed clothes and peace signs, there bred a culture of death. There was one commune called the Manson family. Their leader of the commune was Charles Manson. He led devotees into killing sprees across California. He actually had a code word called Helter Skelter, ironically taken from a song by the peace-loving John Lennon. 
Even a more recent Occupy Wall Street has been anything other than peace, where placards are often filled with hate. Even like this one. Look at this one. It says, eat the rich. That's not too loving to me. And many of the camps experience looting, robbery, and sometimes rape. And if you want to talk about world peace, let me introduce them to you. Meta World Peace, a.k.a. Ron Artest, the NBA brawler made famous in the malice in the palace. He wanted to change his ways, so he changed his name to Meta World Peace. It only lasted until somebody bumped into him, which poor James Harden did, and got an elbow to the ear. Human effort for peace has been tried and tried and tried and found wanting. In fact, according to Isaiah 57, 21, there will be no peace for the wicked. And that is the problem. Mankind is violent. We are a violent race. Because of sin dwelling inside of us, peace outside of us is next to impossible to come by. You may be able to manufacture peace for a season, but not a lifetime. So practically then, this beatitude makes no sense, does it? Blessed are the peacemakers. If it's not really possible, then why would God put this in here? Is this a waste of time? No, not at all. Because again, we have to go back to how we understand the verses in the beatitudes. This study is a discipleship movement, a pathway of how Jesus leads us down this path to Christian life. There's an order to it. You just can't pick a beatitude like you can a topping for ice cream and say, oh, I like that one, that peace one. Oh, that one's good. That, oh, the one of poor and more. I don't like that. But the peace one, let's, let's promote that. No, it comes in order. Look at the order, starting in verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, those who deep down know they're wicked. I'm in poverty. Why? Because, you know, then they'll be led to mourning over that. And in their mourning, they'll find comfort from God. And then when they find comfort, they'll realize in the light of God, I'm nothing. And they become meek, a humble person. A humble person who doesn't push his rights anymore. And then in your humility, you recognize, I can't do this on my own. And so you start hungering and you start thirsting. For righteousness. And God starts filling you. And as he fills you, you care about people. You show mercy. And then last week, we, we said this is really the pinnacle of the Beatitudes. If God's in you, then you'll be pure of heart. And if you're pure of heart, what's the result? You'll see God. And out of your... Out of your experience with the living God will come peacemakers. It isn't until you meet God will you really have peace. Those who travel this road all the way from the poor to those who are pure and get to see God are the ones who then will go back down the mountain carrying peace. That's the point. God's the origin, and God is the maker of peace. Only those who've been in His very presence have the possibility even of spreading peace. Peace is a byproduct of being with Him who dwells on high. From going up to the mountain where His peace resides. I want you to go to Psalm 11. I want to show you the pathway, how peace gets into your soul. I'll show you how it works. Actually, Psalms is, has a lot, of, it's a lot of chapters in Psalms on how you find peace, how you find shalom or calm, how you find rest. It always works the same way. But I want to begin in 11 to use it as a template for peace or a pathway to peace. Psalm 11. The normal human experience and really the fallout from sin has landed us in a crazy world, a world where... People are violent. There's a lot of worry. There's a lot of stress. And so in the beginning of Psalm 11, verse 1, he, he, he says what we all desire. In the Lord, I take refuge. Refuge is a hiding place, a 
fortress where I can get inside of it and nothing can attack me. Why do we need a fortress? Because look at what he says. How then can you say to me, flee like a bird to your mountain? He wants to run away from life. People in the middle of this crazy, stressful world are honestly scared to death and they're worried. That's the first stage. That's we all, where we all are. We're all scared. We're all worried. And in your fear, you seek peace. Where does this fear come from? Look at verse 2. For look, look. The wicked, they bend their bows, they set their arrows against the strings, they shoot from the shadows at the upright at heart. This, this writer wants to run because the world, it seems like the evil are winning and the good are being attacked. They're losing. The good is losing. And then look at verse 3. When the foundations are being destroyed, what can a righteous do? It's as if everything is falling apart around the good. Everything that they wanted in life, all of their security, all their safety is crumbling underneath them because the evil are attacking. It's just full of anxiety, this psalm. Have you ever felt anxiety like that? Helplessness? Sounds to me like politics. What if my candidate doesn't get elected? Oh. <laughs> what about the future of my kids? Oh, my ability to pay bills. There'll be no jobs if my candidate doesn't make. We better do something. So in the state of worry, we take control. We want to fight. We want to argue. Pastor, you got to get up behind that pulpit and say something. We got to raise our voice. We got to warn people. We got to get them out to the polls. Some of us in our despair, we oftentimes will give up our morals and play dirty as well. We'll start slandering people too. We'll start attacking and misrepresenting. And some will even morally compromise. Hey, if they're fixing the votes, they're putting those cards in there, and even though they voted for Romney, it hit Obama, or you know, we don't have voter cards. We got to stuff the ballots then. Some of us in this anxiety, and when we see foundations crumble, we just give up. We say, oh, well, what's the use? It won't matter who's president, because we're all doomed. Doom on you. Doom on you. And we, our hands go down, and <laughs> I don't want to vote, because I'm scared to death. So we enter the presence of God, and while our knees are knocking and while our hands are hanging, eyes downcast, when you come into his presence, he lifts your chin, and he says, look at me. I want to tell you three things. Look at what it says in verse 4. First of all, it says the Lord is. He is in his holy temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. He's not scared. He's not scared. He's not worried. When you really know God and when you really enter His presence, you will soon realize He's alive. He's alive. And God will say more things. He says in the middle of verse 4, He observes the sons of men. His eyes examine them. That means He's transcendent. He's above the fray. All of the mudslinging doesn't hit Him. He's above. He's transcendent. He's untouchable. And guess what? He's not a dummy. Look at verse 5. He's not a dummy. The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked and those who love violence, his soul hates. He sees. Hey, if they stuff the ballot box, I'll know. God will know. Yeah, but the media tells lies, God. Don't you know? They're lying all the time. They just lie, lie, lie. I know. I know. I know. It's okay. Settle down. Don't kick the TV anymore. Put down that baseball bat. I know. I know. Yeah, but my boss is a creep. He gets away with everything. He's robbing the company. He doesn't give me enough money. I know. And you know, in God's knowing, you need to know something. He's not indifferent. When he says he 
hates the violent. That means he's not indifferent. Look at verse 6. Not only is he not indifferent, on the wicked he will rain fiery coals and burning sulfur. A scorching lot will be theirs. But how about those that are good? The Lord loves them. He loves them. That's not indifference. That's not indifference. Upright men will see his face. Go to verse uh, chapter 46 of Psalms. It has the same pathway. And watch what the result is when the upright see his face. This is where he wants to lead us. Instead of being scared and worried, he wants us to see him. And then watch what it says. This is an incredible psalm. Verse 1, God is our refuge. We can hide behind him. He's our strength. He's our ever-present help. He's always there. When you're in trouble, he's always there. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. This isn't just foundations being destroyed. This is the whole world falling apart. Though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There's a river whose streams may glad the city of God. The holy place where the Most High dwells. That's his throne room. He's there and he's not scared. God's within her. She will not fall. God will help her at the break of dawn. Nations are in an uproar. Kingdoms fall. But he lifts his voice. And the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The Lord God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see the works of the Lord. The desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. So in the middle of chaos, he's calling us to heed verse 10. So, be still. And know that I'm God. That stillness that he wants you to dwell in is called peace, rest, comfort. Be still and know that I'm God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Now I want you to go to one more, Psalm 73. Psalm 73 is an individual psalm about, I look around, man, and the wicked are getting away with all kinds of stuff. They, came, they, they have a life that just, they get away with everything. It begins in verse 1. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. Remember those who are pure in heart will see God? Watch how they'll see God here. Verse 2, but you know, as for me, whew, my feet have almost slipped. I nearly lost my foothold. Why? Because I envied the arrogant and the prosperity of the wicked. I look around and I'm trying to be good. And all these wicked people, man, they're just, they're cashing in. It's not fair. It's just not fair. Well, he talks about how they're just, everything's credible for the wicked man. Then he gets to verse 17. Look at verse 17. Over 16, when I tried to understand all this, it was oppressive to me, meaning I can't handle it. I, I, just, I just get mad. Till, verse 17, I entered the sanctuary of God, His presence up on the mountain. Then I understood their final destiny. Surely you place them, who? The arrogant and wicked on slippery ground. You're going to cast them down to ruin. How suddenly are they destroyed, completely swept away by terrors as a dream. When one awakes, so you, when you arise, O Lord, you'll despise them as fantasies. Here's what he's saying. If you had the time to spend with God, you'll realize everything you worry about down here, when you finally get to heaven, it will seem like a second. It's like a dream. It never really took place. Relax. Why can we relax? Because look at verse 22. Because I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. I was in... I was a fool when I tried to figure it out. And in the meantime, while I'm acting crazy, verse 22, you're always with me. He's always there. He holds me by my right hand. He guides me with his counsel. Then he'll take me to heaven one day. He's always been there. Be, be at peace. Rest. So to sum up our time on the mountain in his presence, Isaiah says this, you will, talking about God, will keep in perfect peace, that's shalom, 
Him whose mind is steadfast because he trusts in you. Because God's there and you trust in him, he'll give you perfect peace. That's a peace that goes down into your gut. So for those who've been up to the mountain and who've experienced this God, a peace will start changing you and touching you. You'll know it. And then what happens while you're up there, the way I like to view it is when Moses went up to the mountain to see God, right when he got to the top, God said, take off your sandals for their holy ground. So Moses went before the burning bush, before the presence of God, took off his sandals. But then when you have met with God, he sends you back down. And according to Isaiah chapter 52 and Ephesians 6, he's going to send you back down with some new kicks, some new shoes. He's going to outfit you with some new shoes. You take off your shoes up on a mountain, he gives you new shoes. What are these shoes? According to Ephesians 6, they're feet fitted with the good news of peace. Because you have been with him who is full at rest, you now will dwell with him in rest. And now he's going to lead you into different arenas, and you can put on your new shoes of peace. He gives you three new sets of shoes. You know, when you were a little kid, your mom had your Sunday shoes, and she had your playground shoes, and she had your work shoes. God has three different shoes for you that are shoes of peace, but for different situations. And you'll understand what I mean in a second. The first kind of shoes he's going to have you wear are your church shoes. He gives us this pair of shoes when we're around the people of God or the church. The church is in a building, and I'm not talking about shiny new shoes to come into church. I'm talking about this is how you need to act when you're around God's people. God's people are His body. We are to be one. We have the same ideal, same standard, same Savior, so can't we be at peace? Can't we be at peace with one another? How do we do that? Go to Ephesians. If you want to know how to put on these shoes, Ephesians chapter 4 tells us. You have um, Romans, 1 and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, and then Ephesians. Chapter 4. Ephesians was written specifically to, to the church and how they were supposed to be the church. In chapter 4, 29 to 32 tells you how to wear these shoes. Now listen closely. Because if you do this, you'll be at peace with people that are part of Christ's body. Verse 29. Do not. Do not as a command. Do not as mandatory. Do not as in the imperative tense. That means you have to do this. Do not what? Let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. You want peace? Control your tongue. When I was a little kid, we would, uh, across the street, we had four baseball diamonds. And in the middle of those baseball diamonds was this gigantic mound of dirt. We'd play, cat, we'd play king of the mountain. I'd get up on top of that mountain, and guys would try to knock me down. They'd try to run or test me up on the ear. And I'd miss them, and I'd push them down. They'd go tumbling down. Or I'd play the ole, you know, and okay, try to hit me. You know, like you're a bullfighter, they come running at you and you dodge, and they go tumbling down. Ah, oh, king of the mountain. We do that every day with our words. All the time. You know how the church mainly does it? With sarcasm. We rip the people in our home apart thinking it's funny, but actually you are placing yourself above them by saying, huh, way to go, idiot. Are your kids really going to open up to you because you rip them apart all the time? Proverbs, I've often shared this before, but I think it's incredible. Proverbs it talks about words of death and words of life. What are the words of death? I, I made up an acronym for them, ORALS. O stands for obscenities. Obscenities are just a guy or a girl trying to act cool with filthy language. It puts you on top of other people. R stands for running of the mouth. When you always have to talk, you always have to have the final opinion, and your opinion means more than anybody else's. Proverbs says, the fool delights in airing his own opinion. Running of the mouth. I know, I, listen to my story. I got the better, better story. Oh, I know why you said that. 
That's, that's not, you're king of the mountain because you always have to talk. Then you have A, anger, words of anger, just lashing out. Or L, lying. And then slander and gossip's terrible. Those kill people. Orals, O-R-A-L-S, words of death. Then you have words of life, triple E. E, the first one, is can we encourage one another? Encourage means to build them up on the inside. Say nice things, honest things, but to lift people up. Tell your wife, thank you. That was an incredible meal. Thank you. You're a great cook. That mac and cheese was great. <laughs> or <laughs> the second E is it's empathy. Do you know what empathy is? Empathy is when you place yourself in somebody else's life. And as it says in Scripture, and somebody else rejoices, rejoice with them. Don't say, you thought that was great. I got something better. You're pushing them down the mountain again. Rejoice with them. Mourn with those who mourn. Weep with those who weep. And then you have the third E, which is exhort. Exhortation is trying to lead somebody into holiness. We use the word admonition. It just means, you know, you're going the wrong way. I don't think you should talk like that to somebody because it doesn't display Christ. You're not doing it to criticize, but to make them more like Christ. If you control your tongue, you'll be at peace. Look at what else it says, verse 30, get rid of all bitterness. What is bitterness? When you're mad at somebody and you never let it go. So get rid of it. Get rid of rage and anger, brawling and slander along with every form of malice. You know what malice is? Always thinking bad of other people. That person is just a jerk, and I'll always be a jerk. That doesn't help anything. That's not peace. Aren't we a body? And then, then it finishes like this. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ. God forgave you. Those are your church shoes. We are family. We need to be one, and this pleases our Father. Then he gives you a second set of shoes. I'm going to call them state shoes. The, the shoes you wear as a citizen of the United States. The United States is not a theocracy. That means God is not in control of everybody the way we want him to be because not everybody believes in him. Not everybody sees the, the world the way the Bible says it. We are, to a degree, in a secular state. We are to be part of this country. How do we be one? How do we do it? Look at Romans. Because sometimes it's rather infuriating, especially when they want us to adopt laws that go against the primal beliefs of our system. How do we do this without betraying our God? Look at Romans 13, 1 through 7. It says, everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what's right. And he'll commend you. For he is God's servant to you to do good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of your conscience. This is also why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. So the first thing I'd say out of this is be respectful to your leaders. Be careful not to slander them and pray for them. But I don't want to pray for them, and I often don't want to pray for them. But Jesus did say sometimes we must pray for enemies and those who treat us wrong. Pray for them. The second thing is we, um, we need to abide by the laws. God gives a sword to punish. So there is a use, useful um, 
usefulness and force. Sometimes there's a justice in war. Sometimes there is. Sometimes there's an injustice in war when it's only for accumulation and greed and terror. Sometimes war protects. Sometimes law is unjust. Sometimes it is just. So the third thing is we then need to be involved. We have designed a system in our country that gives you and me a voice. Let's use our voice. That's really what we owe when we pay taxes. We also should raise our voice. We should influence. We should persuade. And we should vote for those things which we believe coincides with God's design. God said, thou shalt not murder, right? So we shouldn't vote for those who murder. Abortion is murder. It is. God says, thou shalt not commit adultery, right? Well, marriage between a husband and wife, it says in Hebrews, is what keeps, it keeps the sex pure. Outside of that, whether it be fornication or homosexuality, is impure. That goes against the adultery command. That's why we're for marriage. Do you know it also says that um, thou shalt not steal nor covet what other people own? There's a sanctity in property. Did you know that? Do you know that God loves the poor and he cares that we care deeply about them? And you're like, oh, there you go. So the government's going to care for the poor? I'm not necessarily saying that, but if we don't believe the government should care for the poor, who should? Well, the church. I agree with that. Okay, then as the church, what are we doing to help the poor? We're just getting angry. If you believe that, you need to do something. In my mind, that's the reason the government took over, because the church abandoned the responsibility purpose. I don't have time to go into all of it. That's your state shoes. Then you have your everyday shoes. Your everyday shoes, God gives us this pair of shoes to wear in the world. We daily live with people who are lost. We daily live with people who are heading towards a, literally, a Christless eternity where hell is a reality. You are to live with them in peace. And if you live with them in peace, I believe you will be attractive. How do we do this? I love this quote. Listen to this quote. It says, a peacemaker has a new view of others. He is concerned about them. He does not talk about people when they are offensive or difficult. He does not say, why are they like that? He says, they're like that because they're still being governed by the God of this world. The peacemaker has one concern, God and his glory, no longer the promotion of self. Do you know why there's wars? Because we want to promote ourselves. Do you know why there's an argument in the home? Because i got to be right, and they're idiots. Everybody else is an idiot but me. <laughs> it's not peace. There was a person that spent a lot of time dwelling high in the mountain. He spent a lot of time listening to the Father who is good and is full of peace. And he gave us an example of how we should respond because we have this peace in our soul. And let me show them to you. It's in 1 Peter chapter 2. And in verse 21, this is our example. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. Peter says, to this you were called, and you are, if you are a believer in Christ, this is what you, this is the kind of life you should be called to. Why? Because Christ suffered for you. He suffered for you. He was spit on for you. And so in his suffering, he left you an example, and now we are to follow in his steps. What's his example? First of all, he committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. If you look at the reference to this in the Old Testament, it literally means he had no he had no curses towards people who went after him. He didn't just throw curses out there. You rotten. Yuck. You know what he said about people? God forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. 
Nothing was found on his mouth that was deceitful or full of sewage. The second thing is it says when they hurled their insults at him, he didn't retaliate. He didn't go back at him. He didn't want to up him. He didn't say, oh, yeah? You want me to come down off this cross? All right, I'll come down off this cross. Could you imagine if he came down off that cross? Oh. You, you want me? All right, let's go. Boom, boom, boom. The earth is destroyed instantly. We always come back. Oh, you want to talk to me like that? Okay, I'll give you my words now. I'll give you a piece of... What? What's wrong with us? He didn't retaliate. And then when he suffered, he made no threats. I'm gonna, God's going to get you later, boy. You know what he has for you? All you guys who spit on me? I'm dying and rising again, but you know what you get? You get hell. <laughs> what? I don't think Jesus ever said that. He doesn't condemn. Jesus died so you would be saved from hell. He gave no threats. Why? Because, it says here in the middle of verse 23, instead, he entrusted himself, he put himself in the hands of him who judges justly. Who is that? The one in Psalm 11 that sits on the throne that's not scared. The one who looks down on the hearts of men. And he is going to rain fiery coals of sulfur on those who are wicked and those who are righteous. He will. Those he loves, he will reward. They will get to see his face. It's, it's funny when, um, if you've ever met people who spend a lot of time with their dad, they really start to talk like him. They talk talk a lot like their dad. I, when, I, when I started getting about 12, 13, 14, and my voice started lowering a little bit, still kind of high. You know that Greg Brady, time for change, you know, and people would call up, and they'd say, is this Don? No, 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 this is Chris's son. Oh, my, you sound just like your dad. You talk a lot like your dad. Actually, I find myself talking a lot like my dad. My kids, I feel bad for them. My dad would say the weirdest things. Like, my kids are now realizing if they ever say, you're driving me crazy, my dad would always say, oh, it's not a long drive, Chris. It's not a long drive. <laughs> well, I'd say, well, he'd say, now that's a deep subject. Dad, I've heard that a hundred times. He'd say the weirdest thing. He'd say something like this. Hey, Chris, will the rain hurt the rhubarb? I, not if it's in cans, Dad, not if it's in cans. And I'll say it to my kids. They'll say, where do you get that weird stuff? I get it from my dad. I talk like my dad. It's kind of weird, kind of odd. But you know, if you start speaking, spending time with your dad, you talk like him. If you spend time with your dad, you talk like him. You start talking with words of peace. You spend time with the living God, you're not, you're not going to be threatening people and throwing curses at them. You're not going to retaliate. You are going to talk like your dad and you're going to trust him. The question I have for you is do you sound like your dad? Let's pray. Father, we, um, we want to talk like you, I guess, is what I, I want to say. And to do that, I pray that we would, everybody in here, I pray they'd really evaluate their lives and saying, hey, have I really spent time with God? Do I know his word? Do I know his ways? Father, some of us, and I'm one of them, we're scared to death of this election. We have to be honest with you. Um, on either side, we're scared to death because there's been so much rhetoric and it causes us to get scared and anxious and just saying everything is after Tuesday, it's going to be the end of the world. Father, you're on the throne. Help us to trust you. And in the meantime, when we are with people that are yours, help us to watch our tongues. When we are citizens, help us to watch our tongues, what we say about um, servants, civil servants. 
When we are, God, with our neighbors who don't know you, help us, Lord, to be peacemakers. We thank you for your scripture. We thank you for the truth of it. And, Father, we love you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.